Next, uh, next up uh, is a very small startup. They were a startup, but it's a while back. Um, Adam Bosco and Patrick Maloney from Lockheed Martin. Why don't you start us off? Sure. Um, Patrick Maloney, based here in Boston. Uh, I wear two hats of the company. Uh, the more fun side is I work for the CTO and his VP of technology, and I run our relationship with MIT, where I have a visiting, uh, <laughs> visiting appointment. Um, and we can, we can talk a little bit about what we're doing with MIT. Other side of my life, on the profit and loss side, is I run a space systems company, Advanced Technology Center, our small lab here in Boston, where we concentrate on combining nanomaterials with CMOS-like processes for uh, sensors and other applications for the government. And I'm Adam Bosco. I uh, work in our strategic investments group for a space systems company. Um, I'm also the primary representative for Lockheed Martin Ventures on behalf of space systems. Um, so obviously, Lockheed is a, a very broad company with lots of different uh, technologies and, and customers in our portfolio. Um, Padraig and I represent all things satellites, ground systems, launch, and interplanetary missions is basically the best way to think about it. Um, so we, we put together a few slides just to talk a little bit about how we think about innovation. So I, I think it's a, a nice um, counter to sort of show the corporate side. Um, but at the same time, I want to say we're, we're really pleased to be here. This is an amazing event. This is exactly the kind of thing that the aerospace uh, industry in general needs. Um, we went to a similar event last year at Berkeley. I think we're seeing these types of things pop up all the time. So thank you very much for having us. And, and Tron, thank you for inviting us. Um, it's been a particularly interesting week, and I'm pleased to be able to bring a couple of cool events in the last week. So for anybody that was watching, we launched our OSIRIS-REx spacecraft last week. Uh, so this will be a probe that is going to go to a comet. Uh, it was built by Lockheed Martin on behalf of NASA, launched on a United Launch Alliance rocket. Um, and then in addition, actually tomorrow, hopefully, we'll see what the launch window does, um, we will be launching the Worldview 4 satellite which will have the most exquisite capabilities for a commercial remote sensing imagery satellite uh, ever made. So we have a quick video on that, just to show a little bit of what's involved with building a massive satellite like Worldview 4. 30 centimeter resolution. That's sharp enough to give city planners, first responders, and military leaders new insights into changes on the surface of the Earth. At Lockheed Martin, we're engineering and building the world's most advanced imaging satellite, Digital Globe's Worldview 4. We have ignition and we have liftoff. Launching aboard a United Launch Alliance Atlas V, Worldview 4 will deliver critical information. It will help solve some of the planet's most important challenges orbiting at 383 miles above the Earth every 90 minutes. And thanks to a camera so accurate, it can distinguish the make and model of a car. It's almost like taking a selfie from space, but so much more. At Lockheed Martin, we're engineering a better tomorrow. So I'm from Denver. I tried to convince them to include the Broncos stadium on there. They, they didn't listen to me. But <laughs> and you know, apologies for the video. I always say aerospace companies have the best video departments in the world. But I, I do think it's cool to see um, some of the stuff that's happening right now and, and a little bit at the other end of the spectrum than some of the discussion around small satellites. But I think we'll talk about that in a second as well. Do you want to address yeah. this later? Uh, so I'm, I'm from Boston, so I'm not wearing my free Tom Brady t-shirt right now. <laughs> um, with, with, with so many of our friends here uh, from uh, other, other aerospace companies, I, I didn't get uh, clearance to show, us, show you the inner workings of our tech plan for the next 10 years. But you would be right to assume that it reflects our main customer, the Defense Department. And you know, the Defense Department has you know, shown their priorities. They've announced their third offset strategy. Uh, if, it's, if it's true f to the previous uh, offset strategies, um, they actually don't really know what they're doing yet, and I, I think that is correct. We don't really know what the priorities are. It's still in development, and we really won't know what the third offset is until it's completed, and we see some results of that um, in, in the future. Um, our customers are demanding, obviously, more affordability. Uh, we talked, so, uh, various folks have mentioned 3D printing earlier. We're very interested in additive manufacturing, but sometimes it's not the aspects 
that you might be, uh, uh, assume in terms of new features, new materials. Um, I'll give you a very particular example. We're interested in folks that could give us technology to reduce the cost of certifying additive manufacturing. Um, one example, we, we recently brought in, a, uh, in the past 10 years, a uh, titanium manufacturing system. And you can assume it cost X dollars. We spent 10X dollars getting that system uh, approved and certified and materials allowables and all the different uh, bells and whistles that goes around it so our customers will trust us to use it. Um, recently, actually, uh, our uh, titanium structures have flown around Jupiter uh, and they were, they were printed um, uh, with a 3D printer. So, so affordability, very, very important to us. Uh, we are spending a fair amount of money in that area. We're always interested in technologies from uh, the, the small business community that can help us there. Um, third offsets does uh, focus quite a lot on technology surprise. We were the first uh, enterprise to buy a quantum computer, um, uh, albeit at an adiabatic system. And we are, at the moment, learning how to, work, how to use that. And we're working with partners to actually formulate problems that one can plug into this computer. And we're always interested in new partners for that. Um, with regards to the third offset, Jaime mentioned you know, autonomy. Um, a lot of the public thinks that our, a, a lot of our systems are fully autonomous. And you know, we should dispel that myth. Um, they don't have that high level of autonomy uh, with maybe just a couple of, of unique examples. They're remotely piloted. They're, they're not autonomous systems. They're not really drones. Uh, they're actually piloted. So autonom true autonomy is something that's of a big focus to us. Uh, it's our main focus with our relationship with MIT, in fact. Um, certain problems that we're looking at with there, uh, how can you uh, develop a, a, a appropriate metrics to uh, enable trust in autonomous systems? So if I add feature A, uh, X, Y, and Z, uh, how can I tell the customer that there is an 86% chance of success that the mission will be met, met. And you cannot do that with a lot of autonomous systems right now. So that's, that's one you know, unique aspect. We're obviously interested in how different autonomous systems interact with each other. Um, and we, do, we, do have, we, we are interested in working with small businesses in that too. Um, with regards to uh, unmanned and, and humans and autonomous systems interacting with each other is also another focus of our work with, uh, with MIT. So, that's all very good. These are the priorities of the Defense Department, but one should be aware of certain trends, uh, whether it's a large business like Lockheed Martin or a startup. Uh, contracted R&D through the Defense Department reached its peak in around 2008, 2009 at about $47 billion. It's now down in the 20s. So that's a, quite a, and that trend, is, the trend seems to be continuing. Uh, that's something that worries us. It should be something that worries folks that have started companies. Um, and uh, obviously something that, you know, I, I can't, I'm not in the position to do this, but uh, if, if I was running a company, I would have a great relationship with my local uh, political leaders uh, because that is something that, that, that concerns me personally. Uh, in addition to that, and it, it helps justify the work that Adam and others in, in the company do with regards to having great relationships with small business, we've noticed that uh, in the early 2000s, Lockheed Martin and, and its peers had about 60% of that market share of contracted R&D. That has dropped to about 30%. Small businesses, medium-sized businesses have really grabbed a lot more of uh, the Defense Department's contracted R&D budget, uh, albeit it's, it's on a downward trend overall. And I think that would be a nice segue into, into you know, your activities. Thank you, Patrick. Um, so I, I just finished showing you a video of one of the most sophisticated satellites ever built that's the size of a bus. I don't want to leave you with the impression that that means that Lockheed is not interested in all of the innovation across the value chain that we're seeing, especially as it relates to smaller satellites. Um, we absolutely are. And I think the thing that's really most compelling to us, at the end of the day, there's certain capabilities, mostly government capabilities, that are likely to never be encapsulated in a 3U bus. But that doesn't mean the fact that you, know, you had an increase in launch from 2011 to 2015 of about 10x in sa small satellites. Every time you launch something onto orbit, it's a learning experience. It's the ability to develop flight heritage. It's the ability to pilot a new technology. That is incredibly compelling for a company like Lockheed Martin who wants to accelerate learning cycles. Um, so that's something we're very excited about. I think when you look um, across the value chain, you think about ground systems, uh, the development of electronically steered arrays, um, the disaggregation of ground systems, even the introduction of 5G 
is going to transform our industry in ways that we need to be cognizant of. Um, and then, of course, you look at launch. Uh, Lockheed Martin is an investor in Rocket Lab, one of the more compelling small launch vehicle companies out there. Um, but through our, our relationship with United Launch Alliance, we're obviously always paying attention to some of the newest launch trends. Uh, and just a few examples, uh, I, I, you know, these are things that we talk about publicly. I, I would certainly let you know that this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, but we have focused on um, these types of trends through internal projects and through external partnerships. Um, we actually have a very sophisticated virtual reality lab. Uh, so one of the speakers earlier absolutely is talking about things that concern Lockheed Martin. Um, we've thought about um, you know, we, we, larger factory automation and how to drive down costs of satellite bus. Um, we have a very sophisticated solar array facility in-house that does some amazing work. Um, 3D printing as well, obviously, is a huge interest for us. Um, and the Skyfire mission, if you haven't heard about that, I encourage you to look this up. We are sending a small satellite to the moon, and it's pretty cool. So, and just lastly, I want to describe a little bit to you. All this information is available on the website, so it's, it's nothing special that we're showing you here. But we did rebrand and reintroduce our strategy for Lockheed Martin Ventures. We do have a dedicated corporate venture capital fund. We've made over $100 million in investments over the last 10 years. We haven't been very public about it. Um, but we also hired a new general manager. We're a very active corporate investor. Um, and we'd be happy to talk to anybody who's interested in raising capital right now, because um, we'd love to meet you. Thank you. Thank you.